so let's move on. Let's let's talk about effects in uh, in uh, Final Cut Pro 10 or version one or whatever you want to call it. Um, so you've uh, those of you who have been to Lapsy Pug and those of you who are paying attention. Uh, you know our next guest. He has been with us uh, forever, and uh, he is the uh, host of the Digital Production Buzz. He is also uh, uh, one of the first people in, on the planet to actually uh, use this application and has developed a lot of training video, which uh, will be uh, sold here in the uh, lobby here during the second half. And uh, he is uh, a good friend of mine, and he is one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet about Final Cut Pro and Final Cut X. Please welcome... Larry Jordan. Let me start by stating that I did not write this application. <laughs> and let me just do one other thing. I really do have optimistic feelings about this. That does not excuse what Apple has done, which I am appalled by, but I think there are some very positive things where this application can be useful to many of us in this room, but absolutely not useful to all of us. So the first question you get to ask yourself is, let's learn about it, which is why we're here, and then if it fits your style of working, then use it. If it doesn't fit your style of working, don't use it. But even if it did fit your style of using, for those of you that have read my newsletter over the last many years, you know that I strongly recommend that you never buy the very first version of any version of Final Cut that Apple ships. Not Final Cut 4, not 5.0, not 6.0, not 7.0. It takes them a, a couple dots to get the version right. So uh, separate and distinct from what Apple did with Final Cut 7, I still would say that this is the time to look at and learn about Final Cut 10, but it is not yet ready for any kind of real-time work. Give Apple time to get it working. So just first, I didn't write it. Second, I have always advised that you take time and study it before putting it online. And third, let us just pretend for the next 25 minutes, which is the time Michael gave me, let us just pretend to keep an open mind and see if there are elements in here that we like or if there are elements in here that we hate. Because the reason you're here tonight, aside from throwing sticks at Michael and Michael and Philip and myself, because that's why we're sitting in the front, is to learn about the application. One of the things that I want to clear up from what Philip said, Philip mentioned that he does not like showing the hard drives when you're in the event library. And in a second, I'm going to give you an orientation to the interface. The reason I do like showing the hard drives is that whichever hard drive you have selected that's the hard drive that your event goes to. So if you select your second drive, that's where your event folder goes. If you select the third drive, that's where your event folder goes. And remember when Philip went to move something and it only showed one hard drive? Well, there's two hard drives attached. It's already on the second drive. You can't move it to the drive that it's on. So Final Cut 10 says, hey, I'm smart enough to know I'm already on the second drive. I don't show the second drive because that's where I am. It just shows all the options of other drives you have to move stuff. So it's trying to help prevent problems. And in some cases, it does a good job of that. For those of you that have not seen Final Cut 10 or have only looked at it briefly, it is a mono interface, unlike Final Cut 7, where you're able to drag tabs around and we have four windows, the browser, the viewer, the canvas, and the timeline. We have a single window. We can change sizes of stuff by grabbing on the dividing line and dragging back and forth, but we cannot change the actual layout of the interface. The viewer and the canvas have been combined into a single context-sensitive window. If I'm up here, then it shows wherever my cursor is. Now there's a new form of cursor called the skimmer. Those of you with gimlet vision notice there's a thin pink line that moves underneath my cursor. That's the skimmer. And it allows me to quickly skim through a clip. There's also a playhead. If I were to click, there's now a white line that represents the playhead. So the playhead still exists, but we've added a skimmer. The skimmer can be turned on and off by going to uh, a project if I double click down here and load up a project, this is Philip's computer. Philip, I don't know what you did here, but I want to go to a project. Thank you. Notice over here, 
there's this little blue thingus. When the blue thingus is on, the skimmer is on. When the blue thingus is gray, the skimmer is gray. So if the skimmer drives you nuts, you toggle the skimmer on and off by toggling the blue thingus. Thingus is, of course, a technical term that means that which controls the skimmer. We also have, <laughs> we also have audio skimming. So that if I were to put my playhead here and skim back and forth, when this audio skimmer is blue, I, ha I have a high speed skim across the audio and it's pitch corrected so that it drops the pitch or raises the pitch based upon the speed that I'm skimming. If that drives you completely nuts, you can turn audio skimming off by clicking it and you can turn the skimmer itself off by clicking here. I'm going to leave it on. Philip mentioned, and, and I love taking objection, uh, making, uh, taking um, exception to what Philip says because otherwise fistfights just never occur amongst all of us Final Cut wizards. We're just way too benevolent. But in this particular case, Philip says that he likes list view. Keep in mind, Philip also likes metadata, so you have to excuse him. <laughs> I like picture view. Now, those, if we take a quick look here, Notice that when a clip wraps from one row to the next, the edge of the clip is torn, meaning this clip is going from one part of the thing to the other. Drives me completely nuts. So if there's this switch icon here, when you throw the switch, you're able to change the height of your clips. And notice that the audio track is built in. These all happen to be silent clips, but this gray area down here is where the audio is built in. When I uncheck show waveforms, now I just see pictures turn the switch back off, that window disappears. I want to grab this so that it doesn't show me a slice of my clips, it shows me a single thumbnail for all of my clips. Here's why I like the skimmer. I have 16 clips. I turn skimming on and I can this quickly take a look at all my different clips by just moving through there and I can skim through 20 clips much faster than I would load the clip up to the viewer, play the clip, look at the clip, load the next clip, load the... This is just, not only do I have decent sized thumbnails, but the ability to quickly review stuff is very useful. Down here is the timeline. Oh, the event browser, this part here, allows us to see the contents of a single event. We can group this in a variety of different ways by date or by other keyword categories, but it allows us to see the contents of a single event. The event library allows us to see all the events that are stored on our computer. Events are databases. It's a database that holds media, audio, video, and stills. Projects are also a database. It's a database that holds edit decisions. So there's two databases in Final Cut, one for media called events and one for, one for edits called projects. Those project databases, which is stored in the Final Cut projects folder, and the events databases stored in the Final Cut events folder can be stored on any hard drive. Just as Final Cut Pro 7 defaults to putting your scratch disks in the world's worst place, which is the home directory of your boot drive, and we have been lectured about this forever. Final Cut 10 puts it in the home directory of your boot drive. <laughs> but in Apple's defense, let me explain why. Final Cut of any version must have a scratch disk. Must have. It's got to have a place to store render files. Has to exist. It cannot operate without a scratch disk. The only location that Apple can guarantee exists is your home directory. Your computer cannot start without a home directory. So what Apple has done is it said, I'm not saying it's the best place, I'm just saying it is a place that we know guaranteed exists, so we're gonna to point to the home directory. Should you accept that? No, you should always move it. Same way we always move it for Final Cut 7. But if you're a programmer and you say, I have to have this file, I must store it where it has to be stored. You gotta put it in a place that you know it's gonna exist, it's the home directory. So if I were in their place, I'd put it in the same place and I'd still get yelled at because it's on the home directory, it's the wrong spot. You can have any number of hard disks attached to your computer. By the way, bad news, Final Cut only works with direct attached storage. You can store media to your network, but you cannot store the event folder, nor can you store the projects folder to a network device. They must be locally attached. A locally attached 
boot drive, a locally attached second drive, a locally attached RAID. You cannot use network storage. This is a deal killer for many of us. The same way not supporting multicam is a deal killer for most of us, many of us, not most of us, but many of us. The same way that audio mixing, audio processing is phenomenal. Audio mixing is brain dead. So I'm not just saying here this is the greatest thing since the invention of sliced wheat bread, but I am saying that there are some things that are quite cool about this and being able to quickly review clips is clearly one of them. We've seen that the viewer is context sensitive. We've seen that the event browser is the contents of an entire event. We've seen the event library is all of the events. And we have something new called the project library. All of your event media is online all the time and available to all projects always, period. You don't have to import anything. Same thing with projects. All projects, all projects are always online all the time, period. You have access to every project. However, each project contains one sequence. You cannot have multiple sequences inside a project. You can have an unlimited number of projects, but only one sequence inside a project. You can easily duplicate a project by going to the project library, which is a listing of all the different projects that you have available to you. Control clicking on a project and say, I want to make a copy of this. This would be one way of freezing a project. One of the things that Final Cut does that's very cool is that it always saves everything all the time. One of the things that Final Cut 10 does that's really miserable is it always saves everything all the time. If you're looking to freeze a particular build to say it's locked here and I'm not changing it, we can't do that. I have been lobbying for that since I first saw the application and you can see the amount of impact I have within Apple corporate. It does not now exist. There is an unlimited number of projects and you, your project your ability to go through projects is the project library, which is very cool. And when skimming is turned on, by the way, the keyboard shortcut for skimming is the letter S. When skimming is turned on, I am in the project library, and as easily as I click on a different project, I can skim through it and take a look at the images inside. So I don't even have to open a project to be able to review a project. I just simply look at all the different projects that are available to me inside the project library. Once you pick a project you like, I'm going to create a new one. I'm going to go up to File, New, Project. Keyboard shortcut is Command N. Thank goodness that one remains the same. I'm going to create a new project. We're going to call it, oh, let's call it Effects, because that's what Michael says I'm supposed to talk about today. Just, you know, just in case you don't think I wasn't paying attention. So every project must be linked to an event, just as um, when you're building a database, different records in that database have to be linked together for indexing to work. We must connect a project to an event. However, just because I've connected the project to an event does not mean that I can't use other events. I can use an unlimited number of events, an unlimited number of clips from an unlimited number of events. It's just that when I first create the project, it's got to be connected to an event. Just the way the databases work. They've got to hook together. Big point here, when you set your video properties, this is the same thing we do in Final Cut 7 where you drop a clip to the timeline and it says, do you want to change the sequence settings to match the clip? Well here, that's the default setting. You don't have to know what your video format is. It will automatically configure the project to match your video format. And for those of you that have been scratching your head over drop and non-drop, interlaced versus progressive 1080, and is it really 1440 or is it 1920, and what's a square versus rectangular pixel, and you're about to start beating up on the dog, this solves the problem. Just leave it set to automatic. You can set it to custom, and when you set it to custom, you have all these different flavors up to 4K. 4K in Final Cut just drops my jaw, as it were, because what's it doing there? I mean, anyway, 4K picture. <laughs> Normally it would, <laughs> but it's there. Then you've got all the different resolutions, you've got all the different frame rates, so you can, but most of the time I leave it set to automatic, because it's just easy. But the audio property is just wrong, and I want to explain that to you. By default, the default setting for audio is a surround mix. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't do many surround mixes. 